Continuamos la jornada con la mesa dedicada a ejemplos internacionales de mecenazgo y patrimonio cultural. Hemos escogido tres ejemplos que proceden de tres países con una tradición filantrópica muy diferente y que a su vez representan tres formas distintas de fomento del mecenazgo cultural. Por un lado, desde la iniciativa privada. En ese caso, contamos con la presencia de Tracy Roberts, de Lo Vitali. Ella es su vicepresidenta y uh, es estadounidense, es graduada en lingüística por la Universidad de California en Los Ángeles, pero ha desarrollado gran parte de su carrera profesional en Italia. Antes de incorporarse al equipo de Love Italy, eh, trabajó como directora ejecutiva del Festival de Música de Cámara de Roma y eh, en este puesto también realizó tareas de captación de fondos. A continuación, como representante del fomento del mecenazgo cultural desde el ámbito estatal, contamos con la presencia de Robert Ford. Es historiador e historiador del arte y además de un extenso trabajo en estos ámbitos, desde la, desde la administración francesa dirigió el Departamento de Comunicación y Mecenazgo de la Dirección de Museos del Ministerio de Cultura y desde el año 2006 es el jefe de la misión de mecenazgo de este mismo ministerio, un servicio dedicado al fomento del mecenazgo cultural en el país y que ha servido de inspiración para la creación de la unidad Cultura y Mecenazgo de nuestro Ministerio de Cultura. Hoy conoceremos el impacto que las distintas medidas estatales relativas al mecenazgo cultural han tenido en el patrimonio francés. Finalmente, y como punto de encuentro entre las dos primeras ponencias, contaremos con un ejemplo de lo que la cooperación público-privada en el ámbito del mecenazgo puede hacer por el patrimonio cultural. Este ejemplo nos lo trae Peter Beck, que es un ejemplo de match funding en el Reino Unido. Peter es máster en Política y Administración Pública por la Universidad de Alborg en Dinamarca y ha trabajado a lo largo de su carrera en aspectos relacionados como la inno con innovación en el sector público, primero en empresas como Innovation Unit y posteriormente en Nesta, una organización que es reconocida internacionalmente por su apuesta por la innovación en distintos ámbitos. Peter es su jefe de investigación en economía colaborativa y desarrolla su trabajo en ámbitos como la aplicación del crowdfunding y las nuevas tecnologías en innovación pública y social, entre otros. Pues sin más dilación, cedo la palabra a Tracy, que nos va a explicar el ejemplo de Love Italy. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here to talk about Love Italy and to meet all of you because I realize that um, if we can all work together, we can really do amazing things. And uh, just working alone is um, a big challenge. And so I would be really pleased to meet all of you, any of you here after, after the break or during the break. So I'm going to talk about Love Italy, but first I wanted to show a video um, about who we are. Well, I certainly love Italy and have always loved Italy and I've always come here as an archaeologist because it is the most wonderful archaeology there is in the world. It has such range, such diversity and frankly it's such a pleasure to visit. California. I ran a business in Rome for 30 years. I love this city and I love this country. There are many of us worldwide who share this passion. One day I had a dream to do something for Italy's amazing cultural heritage. The dream became reality because of our incredible team. Love Italy is a crowdfunding platform and we developed this project because we would like to connect uh, our beautiful uh, heritage with the people that appreciate it in every part of the world. Actually, it is the oil revenues for Italy forever. 
Everyone talks about oil revenues in the North Sea or in America or in Russia, but they're always finite. And one thing's for sure that Italy's cultural heritage is forever, and as a result, many of its cities, and certainly Rome, will remain great whatever happens to the world. And that's why protecting, looking after, and using those resources sensibly is so fundamental. Italy is becoming the laboratory to experiment new forms of governance for cultural heritage. Cultural heritage is becoming more and more something that the public, the private and the not-for-profit sector should take care of together. Live Italy, it's a call for everyone to be involved and to take their small share of responsibility in trying to preserve all this beauty for them, their children and the future generations. The big names of fashion in Italy started a movement to safeguard cultural heritage in this country. Now this movement needs to become international because these treasures belong to the whole world and everybody must partake in safeguarding them. In 2012, we did a great joint venture with Lewis University. Now our brand is Lewis and Labs, a new digital project, in this case the Accelerator. We have 300 people and 50 of them they have competencies in social media. The best channel to communicate our project and to raise money. When you actually look at Italy, and look at its patrimony. Yes, the Colosseum is great. Yes, the Vatican Museum is great. But actually, Italy has an absolute amazing range of smaller museums and monuments of treasures that you'd never imagine in many other countries of the world. And they're stuffed into every single place that you go to. Cultural heritage does not belong to me, you or the Romans. It belongs to humanity. like to do is transmit as an act of falling in love towards all this beauty. Join Love Italy. Become a stakeholder in sustaining Italy's cultural treasures that belong to all humanity. So that's our video, our promotional video, obviously. Um, but I wanted to show it to you because it gives an idea of who we are at Love Italy. It's, it's all about our members. And um, in this presentation, I just wanted to go quickly and let you know who we are, what we do, and then give some final considerations. Um, we started as a crowdfunding platform, as you saw in the video that was explained, um, because we wanted to give back to Italy, especially in a time in Italy, in Rome in particular, there's a lot of complaining and giving the blame to the politicians. And we thought all of us need to do something, just a small thing, to give back. And so when I had a conversation with Luigi Capello, who founded this uh, digital startup accelerator, which at the time, 2014, was the biggest in Europe. I don't know if it still is. And uh, you see all these young people that uh, have ideas for a new business. And it was this e electric environment. And he and his partner said, let's do something. And so they became the first members. And then I thought, OK, so all of us are passionate, but none of us really have any um, academic cultural um, experience. So we need to start approaching people who do. And that's when I went directly to Richard Hodges, who's no, not only president of the American University of Rome, but he is also um, involved in, the. F it was the first public um, private collaboration in conservation in Herculaneum, which is an archaeological site near Pompeii. So I approached him, I said, we need to duplicate this. Le will you come with us, be a part of our project, and be our president? And he said, yes. So this is, um, oops, I forgot to change the thing. Um, and that's our story. Um, I'll give you a chance to look. So I just want you to keep in mind that not all of us have 
the experience that you in this room have, the academic cultural experience. We're ordinary people, we're professionals, and we really, um, we have a lot of passion and we really want to do something for Italy. Um, maybe we're a little bit crazy because um, we're crowdfunding for the uh, cultural heritage, so the public administration, which is really hard. Um, and let's see, let's go forward. So as I talked about Richard Hodges, it's about our team. Richard Hodges, as I explained before, we have um, board members. Um, we are recognized by the Italian government after three years of operations. We've got members and we have a scientific evaluation committee which is very important for us. Um, we, is, we are a young organization uh, 2014 we started. So we needed to build trust and credibility, especially working with the uh, public administration. And so obviously Richard Hodges, um, he opened a lot of doors for us. When I went to see the director um, of Pompeii, the archeological site, and I told him Richard was our president, he said, okay, what do you wanna do? And so it was an experiment. Pompeii at the time didn't need crowdfunding, but they, thought this could be a fun thing. So that was one of our first projects and it was thanks to Richard. Just another example in the video, Francesco Sforza Cesarini, he belongs to a family that goes back to first before the Renaissance where they were um, one of the main leaders of Italy. So he, he's one of the executive members of the Historical Home Association. And he's also brought a lot of credibility to our organization. So people trust us, they see who we are and what we're doing. And that led us to being able to work with, with these organizations. Like you said, we're very young, but we have some very, very prestigious organizations that we work with. We even signed an agreement that I'll talk about later with the Italian ministry, the direction um, um, of state museums. And y y we've got a pretty impressive um, resume uh, and we're doing some amazing things. We, I forgot to mention before, we are a grassroots organization, a nonprofit organization, and it's mostly through volunteers. So we really are doing a lot of uh, amazing things. So here's a quick glance at our work. Um, we started with crowdfunding, and I'll talk about the other initiatives that we've brought, um, that we're doing, because crowdfunding for cultural heritage is, like I said, really hard. It's hard because we're doing things the right way. It's really important for us. So we, um, we had either approached some people through our contacts in our organization or people approach us. So we asked them to um, come up with a proposal. We have a protocol um, uh, format on our website. And they have to show us that they have authorization from the government or the cultural authorities to do a restoration project. And so then once, once this has gone through, we have a contract with them. We want to guarantee our donors that, um, that the money will be going to the right place. And anyway, it's important to have a contract with the public administration. And then we launch, we launch our project on the social networks. So being um, specific to cultural heritage, um, we're not generalistic. We don't just have, uh, we don't have a lot of projects on our website because we, we have to go through a really um, long process in getting each project. And the other thing that's a challenge for us is different than if you were to put up your own project on a crowdfunding website and you would you know, share it with your family and your friends and you get everyone to donate. We're doing this through our small group, but we're counting on the owner of the site, whether it's Pompeii or the U Rome University that was digging in, in, uh, near the Colosseum. We're counting on them to share with their people. And this is very new to Italy. And so they don't know how to do it. So we're working with them because this is really the future. So going uh, forward, this was our first project that was really exciting for us because 
uh, we were working with young people, so we approached the, um, the ministry's National Institute for Conservation Restoration, and they gave us a project to work with their first year students to restore the sarcophagus in a wonderful um, museum, uh, it's called the Galleria Corsini in Rome. And so it was really fun. We did some events and we brought a lot of people who hadn't even been, don't even go to museums, um, are not really familiar with art, but we invited them to our event and they could speak with restoration artists and, and, and they become a little bit more aware of art. And that's one of our objectives. We're ordinary people. And what even with our president, Richard Hodges, he teases me. He said, Tracy, you come from California. He's right. I wasn't in the museums. I was at the beach. So these are, uh, we're working with ordinary people and bringing them close to culture. So it was a great, uh, it took six months. We raised uh, 12,000 euro, not a large amount. Um, we wanted to start small. And it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And then we started doing, working with other projects. The Pompeii, as I mentioned before, we were working with a small domus that needed restoration. And we, through one of our contacts, we knew one of the professors that w has been digging for 30 years right in front of the Colosseum. And um, we've been supporting them. That was really hard because it wasn't easy bringing people. You couldn't just bring a lot of people to see the restoration, the excavation. There are limited numbers. We we had to be really careful because the university's been excavating there, but they're not the owners of it. So um, we've also learned that it's really important who you work with in the ministry and the cultural superintendents because some people are very open and some people are a little bit more difficult to work with. Instead, the church is really easy to work with. Um, they understand crowdfunding, they've been doing it for 2,000 years, collecting. So, um, and, and it's easy, but of course you have to get authorization and, and they take care of all the work. And this was a really great project because the parishioners had already raised half of what we needed. And um, so we did some events with them, some dinners, and, and, and then we came up with the remaining amount. And so even with Love Italy, we've been learning how to, I mean, it's, everything is an experiment. And so now we're realizing that, that the cultural heritage authorities can't just depend on us. Because a lot of people thought that all you need to do is put a project on a crowdfunding platform and money just starts pouring in. Instead, that's not the case. You have to promote it. You have to do a lot of work to get the message out. And so here with in Padova, uh, the, uh, the church where St. Anthony's tomb is, they get six million visitors every year. And um, so we wanted to do start small, and there was this little fresco of St. Anthony that needed some restoration work. So we let the, them, we let them do their video, they let them take care of the communications, and a little by little, we're trying to let the other people um, do the work, the people that are responsible for the project do the work. And we become more of a platforming, uh, uh, crowdfunding platform. So here's our project that's at the moment active in uh, the island of Capri. And it's a small cloister in this wonderful medieval um, uh, monastery. And so we're having a hard time, we're pushing, and sometimes crowdfunding stops and then we start up again. We'll be doing an event for the international community in Rome. Um, because Febu in February, because February is St. Valentine's, is a day of love, so we're going to try to get everyone to donate a little bit for Capri. And the Rotary Club in uh, Capri, they also did a fundraising event. And so we're working together and just kind of experimenting on ways to bring in um, funds. And um, this is our Adopt a Column campaign. So where the money really comes from is from the United States. And that's where I'm starting, being an American, um, I'm starting to focus my energy. And you'll see in my considerations uh, later in Italy, and Maria Paz said also in, well, I don't know so much in Spain, but in Italy in particular, most Italians think that 
since they pay taxes, it's the job of the state to take care of its cultural heritage. And then another thing you have to give credit is they can't write it off on their taxes. Now the government is experimenting with, with uh, models for uh, tax deductions, but it still has a long way to go. Instead, the Americans can, they can uh, write off 100% of their donations. And another thing that's really interesting is these foundations in the United States, they, um, they have to give, by regulation, they have to give 5% of their pro profits, otherwise they lose their foundation status. So by November, they're actually scrambling to look to give money. Now, of course, we wouldn't be uh, applying to a foundation that's uh, mission is to help children in hospitals. You would have to find the right one. And of course, in New York, they have most of them, and many people, many nonprofits have um, but, but we're working. We're working. Um, we're working to establish contacts. And one of the first was really fun talking about uh, dance academy. We also um, are working now with the national, the uh, National Academy of Dance, who has this wonderful mural um, painting in one of their dance halls. And so the Ruth, Fountain, Ruth Stanton Foundation in New York gave. 100,000, or wanted to give 100,000 euro for restoration, but they couldn't give it just to the Dance Academy because they didn't have an American nonprofit because they have to be able to write off the taxes. So they contacted us and said, Tracy, do you have a nonprofit in the States? And I said, yes, we do. And so this was really important for us because one, the Dance Academy is um, public administration, as well as the res Restoration School, who we partnered with. And so being, they were the first ones. And so this is how it is. It's once somebody has done it, then the other people start doing it as well. So this is our example that we want to share with the Italian ministry, it said, use us, use Love Italy, because our mission is to support Italian cultural heritage projects. And then we had this wonderful event a year ago at the Guggenheim, where I spoke at a fundraising event, and we raised $90,000 um, for uh, restoration of a cross that was destroyed in, in an earthquake in Umbria, two years ago. So Love Italy is branched out because um, our crowdfunding is not sustainable for us, so we need to look at other initiatives. But crowdfunding is important for us because it means that people can even give 10 euro and they can feel a part of it. It'll take time. We, start, we need to start getting uh, momentum, but we really want to be with crowdfunding because it's the future. Meanwhile, we have been doing some initiatives. We did this challenge with university students where they came up with, um, there were 100 university students in the Rome area that tried to come up with a project for three rooms that were closed to the public in this wonderful Renaissance villa, uh, Villa Farnesina. And that was really fun. Then we've been working with the high schools to bring classes and they came to our um, excavation, the excavation that we're supporting. And then they went back and talked about it and did a little Christmas fair to raise funds to the crowdfunding project. Now, where we want to start pushing a little bit is corporate social responsibility. In Italy, it hasn't come yet. It's, there are very few um, corp businesses that are giving to corporate, or that are using corporate social responsibility for cultural heritage. We're partnering with this travel agency, it's a cultural travel agency, Cicerone. So they're giving five euro for every one of their clients that comes, and um, they're giving to Love Italy and for a project at the Villa Farnesina restoration project. So this is a start, and now we've started to contact other travel agencies that are specific to Italy because we want more of these. One of the American Federation of Arts, this is something that's really exciting that I've been working on for a year. American Federation of Arts was practically unknown um, in Italy. And what it is, since the Americans don't have a cultural ministry, they have this federation that was created 100 years ago by the um, members of the American government. And it was basically to bring art to not just New York, Washington, Los Angeles, but throughout the United States. And so they have museums, um, about 400 museums that are their members all over the United States. So um, 
I approach them and I've been working with them. We've signed an agreement with the ministry and them to bring art in museums or in private collections to American museums for exhibitions and loans. And this is really interesting because the American museums and their sponsors, they pay for restoration and they give money to the museums. So this is another way that we're creating, generating funds for Italian cultural heritage. Um, and then another project that's really, um, really dear to us, there's um, this altar piece in a small pinacoteca in the center of Italy, in the Marche, and um, from the 1300s. And the centerpiece is in the Frick Museum in New York. So we wrote to the Frick, we've been working with them for a year, we said, why don't we do a reunification, a reunification project? And so we're working with the university, um, engineering university nearby, and we're creating this digital uh, reunification um, of the two objects, and and then and then more. But this is something we. So I'm coming to a conclusion. Here are um, I talked about the things that we've been doing and working on. And here are some of the challenges that we've encountered with cultural heritage. Like I said before, most Italians believe it's the job of the state to pay for it. So about 70% of our money comes from international donors, mostly Anglo-Saxons and Northern Europeans. Um, the good news is that in 2014, there was a cultural heritage reform. And it took a few years for all of us to understand what was happening and to set it up. But what has happened is, um, I'm not sure exactly the number, 20, 30 museums now have autonomy. So they are, the directors are responsible for raising their own funds. This was unheard of before in Italy. So now they can um, find sponsors, they can put a little label under the painting or the object, the art object, and give credit and do a lot of activities. And so um, this is really exciting, but it's still in the making. Um, one of the limits that we've had in crowdfunding is, um, and things are changing, I repeat, but there's a limit to 40,000 euro that a public administration entity can uh, receive. Otherwise, we would have to do um, a bid, which is unheard of. I mean, we couldn't guarantee that. And so we were keeping our projects under 40,000. Um, so obviously the church doesn't apply to this or private property. Italy has introduced the law and recently in this reform called art bonus, but it doesn't apply to organizations. It applies to, um, it's almost like crowdfunding for the government, that the government puts on their project on their website and waits for entities to donate. And you can, do, you can write off 60% in three years. It's not working very well. And the last, um, I, know I have to stop, I'm finished, <laughs> I'm finished. Oh, I, I already mentioned that about fundraising, that we're working with the cultural heritage, and, um, and then, um, and, uh, yeah, and these are the things that I already mentioned before. So anyway, here we are. Our desire is to um, make this contagious so that everybody participates. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. I want to thank the... Ministère de la Culture et des Sports euh, Espagnol, Madame la Directrice Générale, et la Fondation euh, Catalunya Cultura, avec laquelle j'ai eu l'occasion déjà de travailler, euh, d'avoir euh, invité le ministère français de la Culture à cette euh, rencontre très intéressante. Alors, moi, je vais vous parler de trois choses. Je vais vous parler de la législation française en matière de mécénat, euh, dont vous verrez que... Vous comprendrez pourquoi elle est... nous sommes très sollicités de par le monde pour euh, en... l'expliquer. Euh, la deuxième chose, c'est le développement du mécénat en France, euh, notamment du développement, le, le développement des petites et moyennes entreprises comme mécènes, et puis le développement d'un mécénat populaire en France pour la culture. Et puis, en dernier lieu, je vais vous parler de, des débats qui ont lieu actuellement en France, dans le monde politique et dans les ministères, à propos de cette législation qui a un coût, évidemment, pour l'État. 
Alors, la France est un pays qui a eu un certain retard en matière de, de mécénat. Euh, cela tient à la tradition politique française. L'État en France, depuis toujours, depuis avant même la Révolution, a été présent dans toutes les causes d'intérêt général. Euh, je pense que d'ailleurs, le modèle espagnol n'est pas si éloigné de cela. Euh, L'État a été très présent... Euh, dans, euh, dans ces causes, euh, à travers, euh, notamment dans le domaine culturel, dans le domaine de l'éducation, dans le domaine de la santé, de la recherche, etc. Et au fond, il a laissé pendant très longtemps assez de peu de place à l'initiative privée. Alors il fallait une volonté politique pour que les choses changent. Euh, et ça s'est passé dans les années 1990-2000, euh, où les choses ont commencé à évoluer. Nous avons eu une première loi mécénat en 1987 qui n'a pas eu beaucoup d'effet parce que les mesures fiscales qu'elle proposait étaient insuffisantes. On était, comme d'ailleurs dans les pays anglo-saxons à l'époque, dans un système de déduction de l'assiette de l'impôt, déduction des dons de l'assiette de l'impôt. Nous sommes maintenant dans un système qui est assez rare et qui est évidemment très envié euh, dans le monde, euh, c'est un système de réduction directe de l'impôt, avec des taux élevés, comme vous le verrez. Alors, euh, le mécénat, en plus, euh, en France, prend trois formes. Le mécénat financier, le mécénat en nature et le mécénat de compétences. Le mécénat de compétences, c'est l'apport pour les entreprises du savoir-faire euh, de leurs salariés. Euh, et le traitement fiscal est le même. Alors, nous avons euh, un dispositif fiscal. Alors, on peut passer au deuxième. Ah, c'est moi qui dois faire circuler, c'est ça Oui, pardon. Voilà, ça, c'est la, la loi Ayagon, la loi du 1er août 2003, que, qui, qui a gardé le nom du ministre de la Culture qui l'a préparé. Alors, je dois dire tout de suite, d'ailleurs, que euh, bien qu'elle ait été préparée par le ministère de la Culture, euh, cette loi s'applique à tous les domaines d'intérêt général. Hein, C'est une grande particularité de la législation française. Euh, le dispositif fiscal, il est assez simple. C'est un système de réduction directe de l'impôt, donc, avec un taux de 60% du montant des dons. Ça veut dire que quand vous donnez 1 000 euros, euh, vous, vous réduisez votre impôt de 600 euros. Et pour les particuliers, le taux de 66% jusqu'à 75% lorsqu'il s'agit de causes sociales. Euh, alors évidemment, il y a des plafonds. Pour les entreprises, le plafond annuel des dons est de 0,5% du chiffre d'affaires. Alors c'est très généreux pour les grandes entreprises, qui d'ailleurs ne l'atteignent jamais. C'est moins généreux pour les TPE et PME, les très petites et moyennes entreprises. Et vous verrez que nous avons... Euh, pour la loi de finances de cette année, donc en décembre, nos parlementaires ont voté une mesure spéciale pour les PME. Euh, nous avons aussi des mesures particulières pour euh, le patrimoine. Ah, je crois que je fais marche arrière. <rire> nous avons aussi des mesures particulières pour la culture. Alors, nous avons euh, notamment une mesure tout à fait exceptionnelle pour les trésors nationaux. Ce qu'on appelle les trésors nationaux, ce sont des œuvres qui font l'objet d'interdictions de sortie du territoire français pendant 30 mois, période pendant laquelle l'État cherche des moyens pour les acquérir. Et il y a un système mécénat très intéressant, puisqu'il permet aux entreprises, il offre aux entreprises une remise d'impôt de 90% du montant du don. Donc c'est tout à fait exceptionnel. Et ça ne s'applique qu'à un nombre limité d'œuvres. Et vous l'imaginez, chaque année, parfois, ces œuvres ont des coûts très élevés. Euh, donc nous avons également un système qui nous permet d'appliquer le droit commun du mécénat, donc les 60 et 66 de réduction d'impôt, à la restauration des monuments historiques privés. Euh, nous avons un patrimoine très important, 44 000 monuments, parcs et jardins protégés par la loi de monuments historiques. Euh, la moitié sont en main privée, appartiennent à, pour l'essentiel à des propriétaires individuels ou à des sociétés de, 
ce qu'on appelle les sociétés civiles immobilières, c'est-à-dire des sociétés de personnes. Les familles créent généralement, les familles propriétaires, ce type de société pour se partager les charges de la sauvegarde et de la transmission du monument. Et nous avons aussi une mesure intéressante qui n'est pas proprement, à proprement parler du mécénat, mais qui permet aux entreprises de déduire de l'assiette de leur impôt le montant des acquisitions qu'elles font d'œuvres originales, d'artistes vivants, mais également, et c'est moins connu, donc ça permet de constituer des collections d'entreprises, si vous voulez, euh, de soutenir la création artistique, de soutenir le marché de l'art, c'est le, le but de cette mesure. Elles peuvent également acheter des instruments de musique, c'est moins connu, qui sont destinés euh, à être prêtés à des interprètes professionnels. Alors quand c'est euh, une très grande entreprise, très prestigieuse comme LVMH, on achète des, des Stradivarius et on les prête euh, à des virtuoses. Euh, quand c'est euh, la banque Société Générale, par exemple, euh, on achète des instruments de musique modernes que l'on prête à des étudiants particulièrement euh, doués. Et ça nous permet de résoudre, d'abord de soutenir la pratique instrumentale de haut niveau. Ça nous permet également de soutenir des problèmes de cause sociale, hein, qui est que nous avons beaucoup d'étudiants brillants qui n'ont pas les moyens euh, de s'acheter l'instrument qui convient à leur niveau de pratique. Et les entreprises, de plus en plus, font euh, ce genre de choses. Euh, alors, je vais vous donner euh, maintenant euh, un exemple de Trésor national. Voici le manuscrit autographe par André Breton, André Breton pour Nadja, 1928, qui, est, qui a été conservé pendant 70 ans dans la descendance d'André Breton, qui a ensuite été acheté par Pierre Berger, et nous l'avons acheté dans une des ventes Berger. Il s'est rentré à la Bibliothèque nationale de France. Le mécénat de trois entreprises nous a permis de payer plus d'un tiers de la, du montant de l'acquisition, qui est de 2 millions d'euros. Et ça, c'est une affaire, je dirais, européenne. Ce sont les deux portraits des époux Sussmans en, en habit français de Rembrandt. Euh, possédé par les Rothschild depuis le 19e siècle, par la branche d'Éric de, de Rothschild, qui les a mis en vente pour 160 millions d'euros. Euh, ce sont des œuvres qui cochent toutes les cases. Hein. Rembrandt, Rothschild, euh, État parfait, euh, etc. Euh, 160 millions d'euros, c'est évidemment... Euh, je, je, je vais faire un calcul très rapide, euh, 30 fois le budget d'acquisition du musée du Louvre euh, annuel. Donc, euh, il a fallu chercher du mécénat. Nous nous sommes partagés, nous avons fait un, un accord bilatéral avec les, les Néerlandais qui ont acheté le portrait d'homme et les Français ont acheté le portrait de femme. C'est la Banque de France qui a payé. Euh, et ils ne sont jamais séparés, comme il se doit, pour un couple. Donc ils sont tantôt au Rijksmuseum, tantôt euh, euh, au Musée du Louvre. Voilà, c'est une, une belle, un beau projet européen. Mais euh, 80 millions d'euros, c'est très très lourd. C'est la Banque de France donc, qui a payé. Euh, la Cour des comptes, récemment, lui a fait quand même quelques observations sur ce montant. Voilà. Alors, euh, un impact de la loi Ayagon... Euh, avant, en 2002, on dénombrait environ 2000 entreprises mécènes en France. Alors, pas mal d'entreprises, de grandes entreprises, mais il n'y en a pas tant que ça, euh, qui donnaient l'exemple. Hein. C'est un peu sur le modèle américain. Encore qu'aux États-Unis, la, enfin, le, le, la corporate philanthropie est beaucoup moins développée que le giving, que le, les dons individuels. Euh, Maintenant, 68 000 entreprises qui utilisent la législation. Donc, un développement du mécénat dans l'ensemble du tissu économique, ça, c'est très important. Et beaucoup de mécénats pour le patrimoine, pour la vie culturelle, euh, parce que, et je crois que c'est un argument essentiel pour faire adopter une loi mécénat, la culture, c'est de l'économie. Dans un pays comme la France, et je pense que c'est la même chose ici, le patrimoine est un élément d'attractivité des territoires, ça, fait venir, ça fait, développe le tourisme, mais ça développe aussi l'implantation des entreprises sur les, les territoires, parce que quand un territoire est attractif culturellement, les entreprises s'y installent et les employés sont contents d'habiter là, 
les salariés, les cadres, euh, sont dans un tissu euh, intéressant pour la vie quotidienne, en quelque sorte. Euh, et puis, euh, je dirais que ça, c'est la contrepartie, c'est que euh, la loi Ayagon, ses mesures incitatives, nous ont permis de développer le mécénat populaire c'est-à-dire euh, un phénomène finalement assez nouveau qui montre bien que, au fond, la vieille tradition française, elle est quand même étatique, elle est quand même un peu remise en question. Hein. Euh, C'est que maintenant, les gens, les Français, acceptent de verser, de faire des dons. De... La moyenne des dons en France, c'est... Euh, euh, 150, 170 euros, ce qui, ce qui, ce qui n'est pas rien sur, sur une opération, euh, des dons notamment pour le patrimoine, mais pas simplement pour le patrimoine, pour aussi d'autres euh, aspects de la vie culturelle, alors que jusqu'à présent, pendant très longtemps, les dons, car il y a une vraie générosité en France, elle n'était pas défiscalisée, mais elle existait, euh, les dons se portaient plutôt sur la recherche médicale, sur l'humanitaire, sur les causes sociales. Maintenant, il y a un rééquilibrage du côté euh, culturel. Alors, la Fondation du patrimoine, qui est une fondation que nous avons créée, en quelque sorte, pour compléter l'action publique dans la sauvegarde du patrimoine, et notamment dans le patrimoine qui n'est pas protégé par la loi, c'est-à-dire ce qu'on appelle le petit patrimoine en France, les maisons de village, les lavoirs, euh, les, les puits, les moulins, etc., la Fondation du patrimoine lève chaque année en don 15 millions d'euros pour aider le patrimoine. Euh, elle reçoit aussi des, 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 des dons des entreprises. Elle développe actuellement des cercles de mécènes entreprises dans tous les départements français. Ça, c'est une, une action de structuration du mécénat territorial qui est très importante. Le musée du Louvre euh, a embrayé en lançant un programme qui s'appelle Tous Mécènes, qui permet de collecter des dons pour recevoir... Euh, pour acquérir, acquérir des œuvres ou pour les restaurer. Euh, je vous en donnerai un, un bel exemple tout à l'heure. Et puis, nous voyons se développer quelque chose de très important que vous connaissez aussi, que toute l'Europe connaît, hein, euh, qui est le, le financement participatif, le crowdfunding. Moi, je n'ai pas le droit de dire crowdfunding. Alors, je l'ai écrit spécialement parce qu'on n'est pas... Mais si j'étais si à Paris, je ne l'écrirais pas parce que la délégation à la langue française me, me ferait des observations désagréables. Euh, et puis, euh, donc, euh, plus récemment encore, vous avez entendu parler de la création d'un loto pour le patrimoine, avec un jeu de grattage et un, lo un vrai loto aussi. Alors voilà un objet exceptionnel. Euh, C'est un livre d'heures. C'est un livre d'heures minuscule. Il est grand comme ça, qui est le, le dernier objet royal français de la dynastie des Valois, c'est-à-dire celle de François Ier. Euh, qui était en main privée. Il était en Angleterre. Nous l'avons acheté 10 millions d'euros. Euh, et euh, il y a, le Louvre a fait une collecte, un appel à la générosité publique pour 1,4 million d'euros. Et le groupe LVMH a payé le reste. Voilà. Donc il y a à la fois du mécénat trésor national, si vous voulez, et puis une collecte de mécénat populaire. Donc vous voyez, ce, ce, cet objet est vraiment un joyau. Et nous sommes évidemment très heureux d'avoir pu le faire entrer au Louvre. Et alors ça, c'est autre chose. C'est le dernier phénomène de la mobilisation du public français pour le patrimoine. C'est une deux structures, une, une agence qui s'appelle D'Artagnan, qui est une start-up de communication, et une, une association qui s'appelle Adopte un château, qui milite pour sauver nos châteaux qui sont dont plusieurs centaines sont dans des états euh, évidemment euh, parfois abandonnés d'ailleurs comme, ce, comme celui-ci qui se trouve en Aquitaine euh, et alors la, la, la solution là c'est pas euh, de faire appel à des dons c'est de proposer aux gens d'être propriétaires du château de multipropriété euh, à partir de 50 euros vous avez une part de la propriété et c'est la deuxième, ce château, le château de l'Ebopiné dans les Deux-Sèvres, et la deuxième opération qu'il réalise comme ça. C'est un succès absolument phénoménal et un succès international. Car il y a 96 pays qui ont participé à l'acquisition de ce château. Qui, en plus, l'objectif financier, c'était le prix de vente 
qui est largement dépassée. On en est à plus d'un million d'euros et on va pouvoir restaurer le château et en faire un parc de loisirs, l'ouvrir au public. Alors Je ne sais pas ce que vont devenir les, les, les quelques... Je crois qu'il y a plus de 1000 actionnaires pour le moment. Euh, je pense que tout ça va se... La propriété va évoluer. Mais euh, en tout cas, voilà une solution euh, innovante venant non pas de l'État, venant d'une start-up pour sauver un bel élément de patrimoine. Et enfin, vous avez probablement, parce qu'on en a beaucoup parlé, entendu parler de la mission confiée par le président de la République, M. Macron, à M. Stéphane Bern, qui est un journaliste, historien, etc., grand amateur de patrimoine. Et nous avons donc, voilà, lancé ce fameux loto qui a connu une édition donc en 2018, avec un jeu de loto, c'est-à-dire de loterie, et puis un jeu de grattage qui a rapporté plus de 20 millions d'euros pour sauver des monuments qui sont sur une liste préétablie. Euh, et la question est de savoir si cette opération sera répétée. Ou la décision n'a pas encore été prise. Mais ça a évidemment un coût important, hein, en matière fiscale notamment. Euh, mais euh, c'est une opération qui a été euh, tout à fait réussie. Donc il y a une liste, une vingtaine de monuments qui vont bénéficier de ces fonds qui ont été versés par la Française des Jeux, qui est la Société de Jeux Nationale, euh, à la Fondation du Patrimoine. Et le ministère des Finances, à la demande du ministre de la Culture, a rajouté 20 millions. Donc nous avons une belle somme pour restaurer une vingtaine de monuments. Et puis, pour finir, euh, ben les évolutions de la législation, parce que notre législation elle a connu des évolutions depuis 2003, depuis la loi Ayagon. Euh, une évolution qui était une évolution euh, euh, que regrette beaucoup... Euh, le monde des ONG caritatives, c'est que nous sommes passés de l'impôt de solidarité sur la fortune, ce qu'on appelle l'ISF, à l'impôt sur la fortune immobilière, donc un, un nombre de donateurs plus restreint. Pourquoi Parce que euh, le, le gouvernement a souhaité que les redevables de l'impôt de solidarité sur la fortune, au lieu de payer cet impôt, euh, euh, contribuent par investissement au développement des entreprises françaises. Donc on n'est plus... Les fortunes ne sont plus assujetties à l'impôt que sur le patrimoine immobilier. Ça restreint donc le nombre de donateurs susceptibles de faire des dons déductibles de cet impôt. Nous avons ces organismes caritatifs, c'est-à-dire toutes les grandes fondations du type la Fondation de France, l'Institut Pasteur, les orphelins d'Auteuil, etc., qui recueillent beaucoup d'argent pour des causes humanitaires, ont perdu 150 millions d'euros dans cette opération. En contrepartie, le, le Parlement a voté une loi pour catalyser le mécénat des petites et moyennes entreprises, lui donner plus de marge. Je vous ai parlé du seuil de 0,5% de chiffre d'affaires dans la loi Ayagon. Quand vous avez 1 million d'euros de chiffre d'affaires, vous pouvez faire 5 000 euros de dons par an, ce qui est assez limité. Et nous avons autorisé toutes les entreprises à faire 10 000 euros de dons. Et donc ça concerne les entreprises dont le chiffre d'affaires euh, ne dépasse pas 2 millions d'euros. En fait. Après, on retombe dans euh, le plafond. Et alors tout ça a un coût. Euh, le coût fiscal, les derniers chiffres, euh, c'est-à-dire le coût de la dépense fiscale, c'est-à-dire au fond le, le cumul de toutes les réductions d'impôts accordées, est de 2,6 milliards d'euros actuellement, ce qui représente environ... 3,9 milliards de dons. Donc vous voyez, il y a quand même 30% en plus. Euh, ça fait débat. Et ça fait débat parce que ben, on est quand même dans une période de tension budgétaire, comme on dit. Euh, et ça fait débat aussi parce que la presse s'est emparée d'un cas particulier. Je dis bien un cas particulier et d'ailleurs tout à fait légal, qui est le coût pour l'État de la fondation Louis Vuitton. Donc la fondation du groupe LVMH, qui s'est installée dans un magnifique bâtiment de Franck Guéry au bois de Boulogne, le coût de ce bâtiment est de 800 millions d'euros. L'État en a payé 500 en dépenses fiscales. Donc ça fait polémique dans notre pays. Et nous avons entamé une, une réflexion qui va durer quelques mois, là, jusqu'à dans la carte de la préparation de la loi de finances pour 2020. Nous allons voir comment nous pouvons aménager cela 
sans toucher euh, à cette loi mécénat qui euh, comment dire, intéresse tout le monde. La preuve, je pense que je ne serais pas ici si elle n'intéressait pas euh, d'autres pays européens, euh, et même au-delà. Je suis allé euh, au mois de juin, alors je veux dire à ma grande surprise, en Ouzbékistan. Et les Ouzbeks, euh, qui sont dans une phase de développement importante, qui cherchent de l'investissement étranger, ont voté une loi mécénat pour restaurer leur patrimoine, qui est un patrimoine exceptionnel. Euh, les Tunisiens ont fait de même. Alors je pense qu'en Europe, on pourrait euh, aussi, euh, en Italie par exemple, euh, où la loi française a servi de modèle à quelque chose qui est un, et là, a été voté à titre de test. Hein. Euh, voilà. Euh, donc, ben on verra ce qu'on fait. Euh, la réflexion, c'est de dire que euh, on pourrait peut-être plafonner pour les très grandes entreprises, au-delà d'un certain coût annuel. C'est une possibilité. Euh, on peut aussi parler des contreparties, parce que vous savez qu'en France, mais ce n'est pas le cas uniquement en France, euh, vous avez une entreprise à un avantage fiscal, mais elle a aussi le droit à des contreparties de la part de la structure qu'elle soutient. Alors c'est des contreparties de communication, c'est de la mise à disposition d'espace, c'est de la billetterie, c'est de la remise de, de catalogues d'exposition, ce genre de choses. Et en fait, on se rend compte que ça a un coût pour l'État, puisque c'est de la perte de TVA. Ce sont des biens qui sont mis hors marché, en quelque sorte. Et donc le volume du mécénat étant important, le coût des contreparties est également important. Donc là, on va voir si on peut aménager certaines choses. En fait, le débat actuellement en France, il porte sur une évolution qui est une évolution qui est très intéressante, qui est que des entreprises de plus en plus créent des fondations qui sont des opérateurs culturels, qui ne sont plus des fondations distributives, c'est-à-dire qui donnent leur dotation, qui répartit leur dotation entre des acteurs de l'intérêt général, qui sont elles-mêmes des producteurs de programmes culturels. Et euh, le débat, c'est est-ce que c'est le rôle des entreprises de faire ça, etc. Mais ce sont des, des programmes extrêmement intéressants. Les Galeries Lafayette ont créé une fondation qui a été inaugurée en mars 2018, euh, un, un des grands investisseurs français dans les collectivités territoriales qui s'appelle Fiminco est en train de créer une fondation au nord de Paris une fondation opératrice les Cognac Martel qui appartiennent au groupe Pernod Ricard ont créé une fondation une deuxième fondation du groupe euh, d'art contemporain à Cognac euh, le, la financière Carmignac est une des grosses institution financière française euh, privée a créé une fondation d'art contemporain sur l'île de Porquerolles. Et puis vous avez euh, la fondation Vuitton, qui est une chose magnifique, qui attire beaucoup, beaucoup de monde à Paris. Euh, et vous savez que nous allons inaugurer début 2020, ce qui n'est pas une fondation, ce qui est une entreprise, une société, mais qui s'inscrit un peu dans la même logique, qui est la collection Pinot. Euh, entre le, près du Louvre, près du ministère de la Culture. Euh, voilà. Donc il y a une tendance des entreprises françaises. Et quand elles profitent de la loi mécénat pour le faire, ce qui est tout à fait légal, hein, euh, l'exemple ancien, c'est la fondation Cartier, qui est une fondation très prestigieuse, euh, eh bien, il y a un coût, évidemment, élevé en dépenses fiscales. Mais après tout, on peut considérer que le développement de la culture euh, soutient à la création artistique est un élément essentiel de l'intérêt général et de la vie économique de notre pays. Voilà. Donc, pour la présentation, j'ai une question pour vous. Donc, regardez sur vos téléphones, regardez moi. Combien de vous, dans la room, ont actually backed a crowdfunding campaign Combien de vous ont tried supporter quelqu'un Show of hands. Alright. Actually, not that many. Combien de vous ont tried fundraising pour un projet through crowdfunding Very few. Okay, so top tip from today, the best way to learn, no, actually the third best way to learn about crowdfunding is listen to me. The second best way is try and back someone with some money, and the very best way is to try to raise some money yourself. So I think, forget everything I'm saying, just, just try and do it yourself. Um, okay, I'm going to skip everything about Nesta, because we're running out of time. I'll just jump quickly into this. So my name is Peter Beck. Uh, I work at uh, Nesta, and I lead our work on crowdfunding and this thing we call the collaborative economy. The unique thing about us as an organization is that we can both do the kind of think tanky research bit. We have a lot of PhD scientists who work with the organization. But we also have a big foundation behind us so we can kind of walk the walk. If I have an idea, an experiment, I can test it out in practice. 
So up there on your left-hand side, you have uh, kind of six years of research, kind of understanding crowdfunding in the UK, you know, how it changed anything from startup finance, how we buy shares, how small businesses take loans, uh, how governments should uh, come up with a new kind of small banking policy, and so on. Uh, and a, a new study we did a year ago on uh, what it means to uh, kind of change giving and philanthropy in the UK without any match funding, just how does it change how we give to philanthropy. We do a lot of work around the future of this. As I mentioned, I've done quite a lot of work with the UK government, Bank of England, uh, Charity Commission, and others around what should uh, tax relief, uh, government policy, investment in, in the sector look like, uh, and hopefully they'll listen to us. Uh, but finally, we do a lot of programs as well. So uh, how can we test out if these things actually work in practice? And I think with any sector, uh, uh, you know, the early, early years of crowdfunding was dominated by uh, platforms sometimes overselling uh, the sector and what it can do, and that often does the kind of longevity and sustainability of the sector uh, kind of some harm, I think. I think sometimes we think uh, crowdfunding is really easy, for example. It's easy money, you just launch a campaign, people come running to you, and as uh, you said, it's incredibly hard, most people fail. Uh, the crowd can be quite tough on you if you don't give them what they want as well. So, uh, you know, how do we kind of sell the right and tell the right story about what crowdfunding is? I also speak very fast, by the way, with a Danish accent. So uh, if you two here in the front, so you can just tell me if it's too fast. Raise your hand and I'll slow it down. A little bit. OK, great. Good. So this is the context for crowdfunding in the UK. So every year we did this market study working with the whole UK uh, industry on how much money they turn around in terms of loans, donations, investments. And you can see this kind of rapid transformation of finance, right? So 2012, it was nothing. 2015. It's 10% of all small business <coughs> loans in the UK, 16% of how startups are kind of uh, invested in and so on. Um, and it's really transformed the world of banking and finance. And it's starting to take increasing kind of, uh, um, kind of markets in, in the world of giving. Um, and as part of that, we've also seen big banks, traditional investors try to work alongside the crowd in, in the private sector in terms of investment. As part of that, we also want to understand what does it mean when that is happening within the social sector, civil society, arts and philanthropy. And uh, we've been lobbying quite hard for uh, an experiment on this, and we're really happy to see the UK Department for Culture, Media and Sport uh, launch this uh, pilot where they mentioned Nesta as the kind of lead partner, working with the Arts Council England and the Heritage Lottery Foundation, the two biggest funders of arts and heritage in, in the UK, on a pilot that would test out match crowdfunding for arts and heritage in the UK. So when we say test, we actually mean it. So we wanted to conduct quite a rigorous experiment around kind of the pros and cons, the benefits uh, to match crowdfunding. The first thing we did was to try and do kind of a quick scan on what's happening across the UK. Uh, quite a lot of platforms, but a relatively small market. We think around uh, in 2017, it was around about a million um, that institutional funders have put into the market through crowdfunding. I think there's a definitional challenge here around what we mean by crowdfunding. I think some of the stuff that we talked about today, I would say isn't crowdfunding, uh, but I won't have that fight now. Um, but the, the main thing is to say, I think it tripled uh, in 2018 and it will double again this year because institutions increasingly see crowdfunding as a way to better reach out to, to the public and leverage more money. This is how crowdfunding, uh, when it's matched, basically works. There are these four models. You can read about them in our report. But the really, really crucial element here is that you add an element to, to fundraising and giving. right? Because traditionally, in crowdfunding, you have platforms and people. Uh, in match crowdfunding, you have platforms, institutional funders, and people, and they have often very different priorities and very different dynamics. Crowdfunding, for those of you who tried it, it's incredibly messy, it takes time. Uh, people are up at 4 o'clock in the morning, kind of fundraising and so on. Those of you who do grants will know it's a very structured process. It starts on one day, it finishes the other. Uh, we don't kind of react to social media cycles and kind of random YouTube campaigns, but that's crowdfunding. So the challenge is, how do you make these two worlds meet? I hope you agree. Um, so we interviewed uh, lots of uh, organizations across the UK, including the Mayor of London's team, who've uh, kind of set up, I think, the Europe's largest match crowdfunding campaign. They now spend more than 1.8 million pounds on backing civic projects in London, parks, food markets, and so on, around some of the uh, kind of pros and cons. So why did they do it, and what are the experience are, are the main challenges? I'm not going to go through all of these, but just say that the, the main reason that people do it is uh, trying to attract new people. I think most funders are aware that they often fund the same people over and over again. They speak to the same audiences, and they struggle with getting public engagement in, in what they do. A bit like with museums, you want new people through the door. You don't want to speak to the same uh, people who already know what you're doing. Also, an ambition around kind of making your money go further. There's increasing demands on matched funding, cuts to public services, and so on. Also means there's increasing interest in how can you attract new sources of funding, uh, and so on. Um, 
over there you have the challenges. There shouldn't be many surprises there, but, but I guess the, the kind of the main ones are around uh, these different dynamics, uh, crowd versus grant makers, um, but also the risk around increasing inequality. So this is something that all funders really bring up, saying, well, if we leave uh, decisions over to the crowd, that means that everybody who's got a euro, a pound, can decide what happens, and it means that people who don't have any money can't decide what happens with our money, and that risks increasing inequality. How do we address that? Um, and a lot of these insights kind of went into, into our, our research and some of the questions we raised with, with projects. So I'm going to give you uh, kind of five, ten minutes with some quick insights from the pilot we ran, uh, including some of the design we put into the pilot, and then if you have any questions, we can take them after. So this is the basic uh, kind of setup. Um, we had two funds. Uh, each of them had £125,000, which I think post-Brexit is €125,000 uh, <laughs> as well. Uh, just be more. Um, and we set to projects that you could raise between uh, four and £40,000. You can get up to 50% in, in a match from the institutional funder. And we would, I mentioned earlier, there are these two, there's four different kinds of match funding. We applied two different kinds. One is the top up, which is say if you need to raise 100,000 pounds and I do a top up match, it means you have to raise 75,000 pounds and I give you the last 25. So you have to work with the crowd and get them to 75 and then the top up comes from the funder. The other one is bridging, which is you come in in the middle. So you need to raise 100,000 pounds. I come in around 33, 40,000 pounds, give you 25, you get to 65 and then you have to get the rest from the crowd. Because we had a hint basing, uh, based on existing data from platforms that those were the two most effective models, so those, those are the ones we should test. Some people disagree, but we had limited funds, so we can only test two, two different models. And this is the, the sign of the, the kind of the scheme. So imagine you have a traditional kind of crowdfunding uh, platform, and we set out that there is a heritage element with one fund and an arts element with, a, with another fund, and then people could pitch projects. The way we designed it is that the funders would not look at projects unless they, has, unless they had 25% commitment from the crowd. What that did was that we saved funders a lot of work because basically the crowd filters out all the crap projects. There's a lot of, if you, if you spend a day browsing around a, crap, uh, a crowdfunding platform, you'll see a lot of really, really, really bad ideas. It's just the reality, right? That's also why 60% of projects on Kickstarter fail, because they're shit. Like, you know, and, and, and that's the reality, and it's good, right? And failure is a good thing in, in this context. But that means that the experts within the foundations get to look at the good projects. So uh, you see up there, uh, 294 uh, projects applied, 69 hit 25%. Uh, 60 out of, the six out of 69 um, were approved by the founders. So the founders said, we actually like this idea as much as the crowd does, we want to back it. And of the 60, 59 then went on to kind of further raise the rest of the capital from the crowd. So there's also this uh, both positive and potential negative side here that, how are we doing for speed of my talking? It feels fast. Yeah, good. I'm so excited about this. Um, but there's this thing that once the institution backs a project, it both gives it money, but also legitimacy, which means that other crowd backers are likely to come in and run with the institution. So you have to think about that as an institutional funder, that once you've given a label of approval to a project, uh, the crowd will kind of run with that as well. So one of the critiques of crowdfunding is that it's a kind of a big city hipster thing. So it only happens in London, Barcelona, and Madrid, for example. But actually, we were really pleased to see a spread uh, across the country. Um, so people from up north in Inverness. So that's a ship up there, HMS Discovery. Uh, they've done most of the restoration of the project, but they needed to fix the two masts there in the front. So they raised, I think, 80,000 pounds to basically restore two masts in the middle of the ship. And people who backed it got a free tour around the ship. Some people who gave a lot of money got a little plague and so on. But quite a cool project. This down here is a, is a play with a, with a kind of a museum. They wanted to get young people involved in a play to help them understand uh, some of the heritage culture. And they raised, uh, I think, something like 6,000 pounds for that. But it's like l quite a big spread in size of the campaigns. Uh, what we did was uh, we uh, surveyed everyone who invested in projects, all the uh, crowd backers. We surveyed all the projects who fundraised. Uh, we interviewed uh, the foundations, and then we worked with the platform, and this is the trickiest bit, on getting all the data from the crowdfunding platform. So anything around kind of uh, backer, geographical location, dynamics, when do people give, information that we put on the page that increased dynamics of giving and so on. That allowed us to test quite a lot of variables in what makes a successful crowdfunding campaign. So, show of hands, does it make sense so far? Yeah? No? Okay. Yeah, good. Fine. Um, I'm not going to tell you about that project. You can look at it online. So, most debates around match crowdfunding is around the money. 
people uh, generally think that it's about uh, raising more money, and it's the first thing that comes to most funders' kind of thoughts. So it's like, yes, we can create more money, more money for projects, we want it back anyway. So we did look at that, and uh, most crowdfunding platforms will tell you the same stats. Uh, in our case, uh, we put in uh, something like what 250,000, and we've got another 405,000 uh, from the crowd. So you can see out there that you know, f in the arts project, that's for every, every one pound in, you get one pound 80 from the crowd, and for heritage, it's one pound in, one pound 44 in, which is great. Right? That's a good story around leveraging more money from the arts. Um, I think the really crucial question, though, is where does that money come from? So what you really want to avoid with match funding is that people who now give to you by crowdfunding actually just takes the money they're going to give to you anyway and just put it through a crowdfunding platform. There's no additionality, and you don't get more money into the sector. So we surveyed everybody uh, who backed the project to ask, to ask them, uh, where did the money come from and wh who are you? <laughs> so 86% had never backed the specific project before, so they had no financial connection to the project, that being the ship, for example, or the museum that did installation, which is a really good story. Um, but 20% uh, percent had never backed the sector before, so I've never given to an arts or heritage project before. So it's one in five. So if you sit there and you're the Arts Council, this is a really, really positive thing because you are looking to kind of increase the giving base for your sector. We also asked people where does the money come from. So to what extent is this money you would otherwise give to charity? 22% said uh, that was the case, but 78% said it was new money. So money they would normally spend on buying a cup of coffee or spending money for kind of everyday. Um, there's a lot more data in, in the report on this. Um, we also did some controlling around kind of if people give more when there's a match, they do. <coughs> um, it's quite complicated, but, but essentially, if you put in a match as an institutional funder, you can also give the crowd to, get, to give more because you increase the size of the project. Um, but again, there's some important stuff there around if you are a researcher in the room, you'll know about kind of setting up controls. So in the platform, we created an isolated control of projects that didn't get a match, and we saw how they, they performed, both in terms of how much money they raised, but also in terms of success rates compared to the projects that did get a match. Does that make sense? Good, it's good to check. Uh, of course, you can see once you get a match, you succeed. The other thing, and this is probably one of the biggest myths about crowdfunding, which is that it's lots and lots and lots of small donations, right? High net worth indivi with individuals, rich people, still play a huge role in crowdfunding campaigns. So while you can see up there that you know, the majority of people uh, are people who give uh, kind of 10, 11, or 26 pounds, um, actually the majority of the kind of campaign is, is funded by a relatively small number of people. See the people down here give between one to 5,000 pounds. And it's an important way of saying that this is another way for projects to both attract the crowd, people who give a small amount of money and get validation from them, but you also attract the wealthy individuals that I know most projects care the most about because they're the ones who can really make things happen. Um, and people get different things, right? So I mentioned, you know, if you are the £10 person, you get a trip around the ship. If you get 5000 you can get your name on the mast. And, and that's a way of kind of tailoring your campaigns to different audiences. So this is stuff that I care the most about. So what happens beyond the money? So 85% of the project owners, they said that we had some sort of non-financial contribution. Uh, three and four, for example, said that they, after the campaign ended, had more support for their project. So for example, through getting uh, new partners, collaborators, uh, local uh, kind of peers. Uh, but also, for example, uh, we asked uh, backers, and 12%, which is quite a high number, said that after giving money, they offered to volunteer with the project. So it kind of increases not just the financial support for projects, but also kind of day-to-day -day volunteering and kind of long-term engagement. More than two in three reported that uh, running the crowdfunding campaign helped the organization improve their skills. So for example, doing crowdfunding, uh, you have to understand how to write a very short pitch, do a video, uh, do some basic stuff around digital images, social media campaigning, and so on, which can actually be quite a helpful way of training organizations into building skills to need for other types of fundraising, uh, and so on. And again, there's quite a lot of uh, detail in the report on the different types of impacts that taking part in a crowdfunding campaign can have on projects. The other myth of crowdfunding is that it, it's about kind of leveraging kind of the global audience for your work. So we compared postcodes of projects with postcodes of backers, and what you find is that 40% or 41% live within the 10 miles. So that's like 14 kilometers or something uh, of, of the project they backed. So it's very much around, if you think about the stat earlier around, most people are new to the project, but they live really near it. So it's about local projects getting new audiences. 
it is, it, is, it is also about getting like, that really kind of random person from, from Australia or New Zealand or the US whose family once lived in the village where you were fundraising for a barn. We had one of those, and he gave them $50,000 in one go because he was like, this is my grandmother's you know, heritage barn. I really want to support it. But the majority is local people. It's a new way of reading a local audience. It can also be about reaching a US audience, for example, but I think it's just really important to understand that it's not just about kind of the, kind of the global non-geographical element. We also wanted to understand for projects, what is your existing relationship to the funder? So have you ever applied for funder uh, funding from these institutions before? Again, the rationale here is that to what extent does this increase the portfolio of uh, organizations that these um, institutional funders engage with? As you can see of the, uh, of the stats up there, um, we did have some success in increasing the reach. I think what's really interesting is when you talk to fundraisers, what they say about crowdfunding is that it's a lot easier to do. <laughs> so doing the match and setting up a crowdfunding campaign and then getting a grant from the institutional funder is uh, less painful than trying to write a grant application. I, I don't know how it is in, 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 in France or in Italy or in Spain, but in the UK, like a, a grant application is, 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 is murder. Like it's, it's incredibly hard to do. But it's quite, I, you know, so we, one of the interviews we did, and we had quite a few people saying different versions of that quote up there, but, you know, so much less of a headache than anything else. And if you fail, well, well, maybe that tells you something. You know, if the crowd doesn't like to back you, probably your, your, your idea isn't good enough. Um, so uh, hopefully I've kind of managed to kind of go for that quite, quite fast. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but I think the, 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 main, the main kind of, uh, and this kind of repeat my kind of opening kind of question to you is the main thing is, uh, the top recommendations from our report is you should really try crowdfunding. Uh, it's definitely not for everyone and not for all projects, but it's relatively risk free to try. You'll spend some time doing it, but remember, you, all you lose is time. Um, and some people might maybe tell you that's a really bad idea you've got there, but that's it. Um, and then you know what it is. Um, I also think there's a whole separate thing around maybe not just thinking about match crowdfunding as the only thing that institutions can do to support a sector to do crowdfunding. I think a lot of stuff more basically around digital skills. So I did another report a uh, year before. This one, uh, looking at uh, how come it is that the charity sector in the UK, less than 1% of giving happens through crowdfunding. And 78% of 500 charities that I surveyed said it's because we don't, we don't have the right digital skills to do crowdfunding. Like, if you look at the kind of the range of digital skills, people talk about like a blockchain, AI over here. There's like setting up a Twitter account and then doing crowdfunding and like setting up a campaign page is here, right? And if people don't even feel they can do that, then we have a huge problem. And I think maybe just thinking about how can you help these organizations, the European fisheries, understand how to build basic digital skills, you can help them tap into crowdfunding, but also lots of other digital tools uh, around campaigning and so on. Uh, the other bit is most of the match funding pilots I looked at, they die after the pilot because like any other kind of innovation project, it's just a pilot. It's not really part of your wider fun funding strategy. And I really say to foundations, it has to be part of how you think about a sector as a whole rather than just something new you want to try and decide with, another, with, with, with a half a million. It has to be part of a strategy. Um, Often uh, projects fail, and we nearly failed, because there's an assumption that it will just work if you just plug a crowdfunding platform into an institution. But actually, we spend, end up spending what, six, seven months on the co-design bit, so making sure that institutional funder, crowdfunding platform, and those two dynamics could work well together, and you really shouldn't underestimate um, that challenge. And then I think there's a kind of whole other plethora of like, other great decision tools participate budgeting and so on, that you should look into that kind of complements crowdfunding. So it's not just about matching, but also other ways in which you can involve the crowd in making decisions around, uh, around how public money is spent. Here in Barcelona, you have, I think, the CIDEM, uh, which is a great example of you know, opening up how the local authority, the city, wants to spend its money. And foundations, I think, could look into that as well as way of how they think about their spending strategy. So these are some of the challenges. Uh, I've kind of gone through them already. And that's me. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, that's my email address and my Twitter handle. And you can read uh, so all of Nesta's research. It's open source and for the common good. So you should get all the data, all the reports. They will sit there. Uh, and we normally try to reply to emails. So uh, let me know if you have any, any questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Muchas gracias a los tres ponentes. Y a continuación cedo el turno de preguntas al público por si existen algunas preguntas. Y mientras tanto, quiero hacer una que está relacionada con uno de los aspectos de la ponencia de Tracy, del final, que tenía que ver con la actitud de la ciudadanía italiana hacia el mecenazgo y la idea de que es el Estado 
el que tiene que ser responsable de la financiación de la cultura o de la financiación relativa al patrimonio. Eh, quería saber sobre esta percepción en el resto de países, Robert nos lo ha mencionado también, y eh, en el caso del Reino Unido eh, la actitud creo que es diferente por una tradición que también existe en Estados Unidos. Y me gustaría saber estas diferencias en cuanto a la actitud hacia la filantropía en los tres países. Y si Tracy, por ejemplo, puede hablar de por qué existe esa actitud positiva en países como Estados Unidos, más allá de los incentivos fiscales. Bien, gracias. <coughs> well, um, being American, and I remember even in elementary school, they, they teach you to take care of your environment, whether I remember even TV commercials, don't throw paper on the, the streets and, you know, don't throw the cigarettes in the forest. And, and there's a lot more participation. I think in the United States, and I see just in my neighborhoods when I was growing up, people want to do something. They, they don't necessarily, they don't, they know that the government has its role and the city, but they do their own things. Um, I found in Italy, that's something that's changing little by little, But um, like I said before, I think a lot of people just, um, they give that responsibility to the government. And now there are activities and organizations that are starting to say everyone needs to participate. Depuis une vingtaine d'années, euh, la loi Bessena a fait quelque chose parce qu'il y a un avantage fiscal. Mais, mais ce n'est pas ça. On ne fait pas de mécénat parce qu'il y a un avantage fiscal. Euh, on, fait, on fait du mécénat parce qu'on s'intéresse à quelque chose euh, et qu'on veut soutenir une cause. Euh, en France, il y, a un, il y a toujours eu un grand développement des associations. Il y a toujours eu... Il y a un million d'associations en France. Il y en a 200 000 qui sont dans le domaine culturel. Le grand changement c'est que les Français ne s'intéressaient pas à la culture. Enfin, ils consommaient de la culture, ils ont toujours consommé, mais c'était la responsabilité de l'État et des pouvoirs publics. Maintenant, c'est différent. Maintenant, les Français ont compris que la culture, c'est nécessaire à l'économie, à la cohésion sociale, à la vie personnelle, surtout. Et ils ont compris que le petit monument qui est dans leur village, c'est important de le transmettre à leurs enfants, que les pouvoirs publics ne peuvent pas tout faire. C'est le grand changement, c'est que les Français ont compris que les pouvoirs publics ne peuvent pas tout faire. Et donc, ils, ils financent eux-mêmes avec des dons qui peuvent être parfois très généreux, qui sont parfois très modestes, mais ce n'est pas ça qui compte, ce n'est pas l'ampleur du don, c'est l'acte qui compte. Euh, voilà. Alors, on, on a aidé en donnant un signal avec la loi. On a dit, maintenant, vous êtes co-responsable de l'intérêt général vous les entreprises et vous les particuliers. Et il y a quelque chose de très important. J'ai entendu euh, la semaine dernière un jeune patron d'une entreprise qui a un succès fou en France maintenant, parce qu'il s'appelle le slip français. C'est pour les hommes. Et ce garçon qui réussit très très bien son entreprise, il a dit le mécénat, ce n'est même plus une question de responsabilité sociale. C'est un concept très répandu dans les entreprises en France et dans le monde anglo-saxon, euh, c'est que maintenant, on doit noter les entreprises par rapport à ce qu'elles font en plus de leur euh, métier. Voilà. Et le fait que leur présence dans la so société, c'est un élément euh, de l'activité de l'entreprise la, la, à part entière, parce qu'elle gagne de l'argent, et avec cet argent, elle peut le transformer en valeur culturelle, sociale, etc., Quería reformular esa misma pregunta para Peter, no solamente sobre la actitud en el Reino Unido hacia el mecenazgo, no sé si él puede contar algo también sobre la actitud en Dinamarca, y qué papel puede jugar el crowdfunding o proyectos de matchfunding en ese fomento de la implicación de la ciudadanía hacia el mecenazgo cultural, desde la experiencia que tiene también en economía colaborativa y por los proyectos en los que ha participado en esta. So, I think two, two things. One is, uh, in the UK, 
I think people give around £12 billion pounds a year in, in individual giving. There's a quite strong culture around it. It's slowly declining. I think that's the kind of same trend globally. Um, I think one of the problems is that we don't measure new forms of giving. So it's kind of traditional stats for giving. So crowdfunding, for example, doesn't feature in those stats, but it's still only a drop. Um, so there's that problem. In the UK, you can gift aid uh, donations through crowdfunding. So it's tax-free. Um, you have a slight uh, challenge. So in crowdfunding, often, of course, you get a, something in return. So you get a product uh, a ticket. Uh, and the rule in the UK is that if the um, value of what you get in return is less than 20% of the, what you give, then you can uh, gift date it as in your tax exempt. But if it's more, I, if you buy something and it's the whole value of what you give through the crowdfunding platform, it's not tax exempt. So that's the rule in the UK. I think it's quite good. Um, people don't care about gift aid. So that's the other thing people give anyway. And they ask in the end, do you want to gift date it? And you can give the additional money you get in tax, uh, tax free, give it that to the charity too, and they do that. But it doesn't, it doesn't influence the decision to give in the first place, really. So I think that's the kind of general. I think there's another debate which we talked about a bit about before, which is so every six months when I write a blog or I do a talk on crowdfunding, someone says, isn't it just funding the cuts to the public sector and the retreat of the state? And I'm like, no, it's not. Like, there are big political decisions around what kind of public sector we want, what kind of welfare state we want. You can't blame a couple of tiny crowdfunding platforms for, for that political movement. They are funding what the public perceives as a need, and we've done that through funding churches, mosques, hospitals, state of liberty throughout history, uh, and here's a new mechanism for doing it. But I wouldn't blame them for society's ills and so on. And I think there's just, like, you know, let's try and get a bit of perspective on, on, that, on that debate. Um, so I think they're, they're the main things. I think there's a kind of an even bigger debate, and you can read about other research I've done on that, which is around the need to look into much more innovative ways of involving the public in most things. Um, I think Spain is an interesting example in terms of the, you know, the kind of massive political changes that this country has seen and how there's been a, quite a, a strong uh, kind of movement around new digital tools for, for participation and political participation, which the UK hasn't seen. And you could probably blame some of our recent political events on political dissatisfaction, and disconnection between the state, the citizen, because really politics and deliberation in the UK is every four years in the ballot box, right? There's no other real tools for, I'm being quite black and white now, but I think match crowdfunding is like one example of 500 I can give you of using lots of different tools to open up the system, the state, institutions to system participation. And I think we need to experiment a lot more around that and take maybe a little bit more risk uh, in, in terms of how we do that. The final thing, sorry, I know we're late on late, is that that requires a whole new kind of conversation around power. So I spend most of my conversations in this pilot that I just talked about around how experts who spent their entire career funding arts and heritage are telling me that the crowd doesn't know more about arts or heritage than they do. And my point is that, and they're like, say, well, the opera project you funded, it's not a really good opera. I, I would never go to it. But if 2,000 people think it's a good opera, isn't it a good opera? Do you know I mean if people want to buy a ticket to go and see it and spend the money on it, why do you get to tell them that it's not good? And why shouldn't we spend some public money on helping these people do it? And I think that that is very, very like I spend a lot of time having those kind of discussions. But you can you can relate that into every other bit of society. Someone who does planning in Barcelona, someone who decides uh, what you can spend your personal care budget on, they'll all say, "Well, I'm an expert. I have a PhD in this. I spent my whole career doing it." It's like, well, say like, that's fine. We need to create the best of experts and the best of people's and people's collective intelligence, and that is what we get with some of these platforms. And uh, so I think that's kind of the the big question that I'm trying to work on at the moment is what do those design elements look like? So you get the best of all the different bits of, of the system. Muchas gracias.